Well, welcome back. Uh, we're in 2 Peter, uh, this time chapter 3. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 was the truth about our salvation. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 was the truth about uh, false teachers. And chapter 3 now is the truth about Christ's return. This is all under the uh, umbrella topic of this letter uh, to be uh, against false teaching. So false teaching often comes in the form of a misunderstanding about end times. And that's what Peter is addressing here uh, to his uh, readers, to his audience. Um, in the first uh, few verses here, from verse 1 down to verse 4, I'd label that reminder. Um, you know, what I do in my Bible, uh, we all mark in our Bibles in some way. Uh, mines are pretty marked up. But I try to put like a one key word out into uh, the, the uh, margins for a paragraph or a, several verses. It helps me think it through if I just look at those key words. So the key word I would use here is reminder. In these first four verses, Peter is saying he's just reminding them of what he already taught them. Wouldn't you love to be in Peter or Paul's Bible study, having them teach you about the end times? Uh, Paul apparently taught the Thessalonians all about the end times. Peter taught uh, his churches about the end times. They just need to be reminded and clarified how rare end times teaching is in the church today, uh, teaching about the last days. It's dismissed, it's laughed at, it's scoffed, but uh, it's important. Uh, the apostles taught it. We need to be teaching it. So I pray that again, brothers and sisters, you're in a church that not only are the elders active, uh, that they are shepherding the flock as they should, not managing the finances, managing the grounds, managing the buildings, but that you are also in a church where the end times uh, prophecies are being taught. And that's what Paul talks or Peter talks about in these first four verses. He's reminding them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by a way of reminder. Remember the predictions of the holy prophets the commandments of the Lord. Again, Peter's emphasizing here, that this is not stuff we made up, right? This is, came from the prophets. Where'd the prophets get it? Well, they're prophets, hello. They have God's word, right? God's word is spoken to them and they write that down. That's kind of the definition of a prophet. That we've got these commandments of the Lord Jesus and um, they, came, uh, not, uh, they came through the apostles. The apostles, again, didn't make this up. They are a conduit of revelation, uh, just as the prophets were. And he's warning them, scoffers are coming, and scoffers are among us. We know that already, and uh, we don't have to labor that point. If we go on to verse uh, 5 then, uh, verses uh, 5 through 7, I'd label that uh, the creation and destruction, two words, sorry, but uh, I'd label that creation and instruction. He said they deliberately overlooked this fact. This is part of the deception that false teachers employ. It's not that they're ignorant. It's rather that their um, version of teaching or that certain facts in the Bible doesn't fit in with their version of teaching. So they conveniently lay those facts aside or neglect them in some way. In other words, they deliberately overlook certain facts that doesn't fit with what they're teaching. And what they're saying here is that the heavens existed long ago, and then by the same words, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire. So essentially what Peter is saying here is they're forgetting something. They're forgetting that in the beginning, Genesis 1.1, also implies in the end that there's a, a, a timeline. There's a, a beginning and an end to history. They conveniently forget this. Um, I uh, just finished uh, putting some modules together for Colorado Biblical University on the uh, beginnings of the Pentateuch. Of course, that's the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So I had the privilege of doing some teaching on the book of Genesis. And um, it's not just Christian commentators that point out the fact that uh, uh, the beginning implies the end. Uh, ancient Jewish commentators saw the same thing. But they forget that. They forget that there's an end. They think things are just going to go on forever and ever. Where's the promise of his coming? He's not coming back. Uh, things are just going to go on forever and ever. So Peter turns to his readers. Okay, they're forgetting this. 
don't you forget something. Don't you forget about patience. That's my key word in this area. Uh, the Lord is patient. Uh, a thousand years is just a day in his view. Don't misunderstand his patience as meaning this isn't going to happen. Understand, understand the delay as meaning that he's a patient God and he's allowing opportunity uh, for salvation. I'm going to come back to this. But that's what he's talking about here. And then in verse 10, he talks about the day of the Lord. So out in uh, the margin next to verse 10, I put the uh, day of the Lord, that the day of the Lord is coming. It's his day. Uh, it's a period of time. Uh, we uh, maybe do a separate teaching on why the day of the Lord isn't a single day, but a period of time. And Peter here is looking specifically at the end of that period of time when the uh, heavens and the earth are going to be burned up. And um, in verses 11 through 13, I've labeled those wait or waiting. What are we supposed to do uh, in the meantime? Well, we're between in the beginning God created and the heavens and the earth are burned up. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to wait. Uh, we are supposed to live lives of godliness and holiness. Verse 14, I've labeled next to that, uh, holy. Beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found in him without spot and blemish and at peace. Again, he says, count the patience of our Lord as salvation. So something interesting here, too, uh, starting in verse 15, he says, Just as our beloved Paul wrote you according to the wisdom given him. So Peter's aware that Paul's also active in ministry. Peter's ministering to the church. Paul is ministering to the church. They are mutually supporting one another. They are not at odds. They are not teaching different things. They are not teaching a certain gospel to a certain period of time and a certain another gospel to other other uh, period of time or other people. They're teaching the same thing and they're supporting each other. And he says uh, he said he has wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters. So Peter's aware of all the letters of Paul when he speaks in them of these matters, which I take to be the end times matters. He says there are some things in them which are hard to understand. I'm so relieved. That Peter says that. If it's Peter have, finds them hard to understand, uh, then I feel better about myself when I stumble across some things in Paul that are hard to understand. But look what happens. We take these verses that are hard to understand, and they're out there. Peter's acknowledging them. But the ignorant and the unstable, that's their entry point. They, they get in that way through those difficult verses, and they come up with kind of bizarre uh, interpretations of them. He says they, um, um, ignorant and unstable, twist the scriptures to their own destruction. And they do this to other scriptures as well. So they got this chain of reference that they've put together, this chain of scriptures uh, that begin with something that's obscure. And then they interpret everything in light of this obscure verse and lead people astray. He says, be careful you're not carried away with that same kind of error of lawlessness, of lawless people, and lose your own stability. So let me just dwell on this for a minute. What false teachers will usually do is they'll take a verse uh, that's kind of weird, right? So in 1 Peter for, or 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about uh, being baptized for the dead. What does that mean, right? There's a Lots of interpretations about what that means. That's kind of a confusing, obscure uh, verse that people twist out of, uh, out of um, uh, its scriptural context, and they twist it. And how they twist it then is they have an interpretation of an obscure or hard-to-understand verse, and then based on that obscure verse and their interpretation of it, then they start finding other scriptures to support it. So you've taken a group of people, for example, that said, well, we need to baptize for the dead uh, and they can be saved since they're being baptized for the dead. And then we're going to go through the Bible and find all these other passages, take them out of their context that support this doctrine that we just made up. That's how false teachers work. They take something obscure, they come up with a, a marginal interpretation 
And then they find scripture after scripture that supports that. Watch for that. Watch for that. Go to the clear verses, right? Go to what's plainly said in scripture. Build your theology on that. And then go see, given that theology on clear verses, see if you can make sense of some of the obscure ones. So watch for that technique. Peter's warning, I'm warning, based on Peter's warning, not on Dan's. So what's our takeaway here? Well, one is just that. Uh, be careful about how people twist scripture and uh, the techniques they use to do that. Also, be careful about not... Um, comprehending all of what scripture says about something. Notice in verse five there, he says, they deliberately overlook certain facts. That's a, that's a, that deliberation, that's an act of the will. So be careful about that. Be careful and stay away from teachers who do that. There's no reason. There's so much good Bible teaching in the world. There's so much good Bible teaching available to you uh, on podcasts, on YouTube, um, you can, if you need recommendations, contact me. I'd be happy to share with you uh, my favorite go-tos. Uh, but there's uh, so much out there that's so good. Uh, why fool around with these marginal teachers? Just stay away from them and go to men who are handling the whole counsel of God's Word. So God bless you, brothers and sisters. Uh, it's Friday. I uh, pray that uh, this has been a very uh, uh, rewarding book for you. Uh, we're into 1 John next week, another good book. Gosh, you know, uh, people ask me oftentimes, what are, uh, what's my favorite book in the Bible? And I have to admit, uh, it's the one I'm reading right now. So next week, today is, uh, this week has been Second Peter. Next week will be 1 John. I hope you're the same. Hope you really get into God's Word and that God's word is really getting into you. God bless your brothers and sisters. Take care.